has always been fascinated by the oceans and the creatures which inhabit their depths. Yet until recently, the deepest parts were a mystery. We knew more about the solar system than we did about the vast, restless mass of water that makes up three quarters of the Earth's surface. Yet recent technological and scientific advances mean that we are poised on the brink of a revolution in oceanography. We're beginning to take these very, very hesitant steps, but it is still uh, something that is so strange and so inaccessible. We've been looking at stars and planets for thousands of years, thousands of years, and we've only been looking at the bottom of the ocean for a few decades. We know surprisingly little about the great volume of the ocean that makes up the largest living space on, on Earth. Monterey Bay, California. A few miles from this rugged coastline lies a massive submarine canyon which plunges down to over two miles in depth. Here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, scientists enjoy a unique access to the deep ocean which lies right on their doorstep. Those of us who were interested in the animals that live deep in the oceanic water column found ourselves in a position where we were trying to describe a habitat and an ecological community that we'd never seen with our own eyes. The important thing for us who wanted to expand our, our knowledge was to be able to gain direct access, to be able to see at first with our own eyes and ultimately with uh, as robotic tools what that habitat was like firsthand. We needed to remove the scientists from the deck of the ship at the surface because there we were just groping blindly. It's the largest animal communities on the planet. In order for us to understand them, we had to get there ourselves. The most important research tool on board the ship is the Ventana, a tethered robotic submarine known as an ROV, or remotely operated vehicle. Built to withstand the immense pressures a mile beneath the ship, it carries an impressive array of cameras and lights and sends live pictures back up to Robeson and his team. The vast percentage of life in the oceans lives in the first 200 meters. This shallow sunlit realm is rich in life. But the further we descend into the deep, the less life there is. One mile down and we reach the mid-levels. Here, the pressure is equivalent to one ton per square inch, and life is much more scarce. Deeper still, and the sunlight completely disappears. We now enter the eternal darkness of the abyssal zone, a vast region that makes up four-fifths of the sea floor. Even here, life flourishes. Over the last um, eight years, I suspect we've, we've come across uh, 100, 150 undescribed species and the deeper we go the greater the frequency that we encounter previously undescribed forms it's really extraordinary how many uh, how many new kinds of critters there are out there that were that we were previously unaware of early sailors believed the deep to be the realm of monsters the bible tells us of waha and the leviathan and most famously of all the story of jonah who was swallowed by a whale. Yet it wasn't until the 17th century that sea monsters really caught hold of the popular imagination. If you went out to sea, as the early Portuguese and Spanish explorers did in the uh, 15th century, when they began to look for a way around Africa or look to get across the Atlantic Ocean, um, they saw a lot of strange things that they were unfamiliar with. And then they came back. They came back, if they came back, to their uh, port of origin, and they tried to describe what they had seen. And there are a great many uh, illustrations of strange and wonderful monsters. 
whales with spikes sticking out of their heads and collars of teeth and gigantic octopuses grabbing ships and sinking them. So there were a lot of early exposure to monsters. But many of the creatures that were drawn in these days turned out to be real animals. Probably the best example of this is the giant squid, once known as the kraken, the quintessential monster of the deep. The largest known specimen yet discovered measured over 60 feet from the tip of its tentacles to the end of its body. An animal of this size weighs approximately a ton and has eight arms, three hearts, and a tongue which is lined with teeth. Another popular monster of the deep was the giant sea serpent. Yet this too had its origins in fact, a mysterious animal known as the oarfish. Sightings are extremely rare, and this video of an oarfish that had come to the surface off the coast of California is the only time the creature has been filmed alive. First sighted washed up on a beach in Bermuda in 1860, the fish grows to a length of 30 feet. Unlike the fearsome sea serpent, the oarfish is toothless and quite harmless. An oarfish is a fish with a large red coxcomb of a crest, and it is, in fact, the longest fish in the ocean. They are probably deep water fishes, like so many creatures of the depths, we know very little about them. Um, things come to the surface for reasons known only to those things that come to the surface. They may be sick, they may be damaged, uh, but they are certainly fascinating to look at as you see this, this silvery ribbon of a fish. It's not difficult to imagine how sea serpent stories could have grown from a fish that looks like this. In the control room of his research vessel, Bruce Robeson finds the creatures that he studies far more interesting than any mythological sea monsters. If you look at mythological creatures or, or reach back and, and read about the kinds of things that, that people imagine might live in the deep sea, um, they are rather narrowly portrayed. What's striking about the things that we're finding and learning is that the reality is, is much more diverse. Many of the animals that we encounter are beautiful, almost beyond description, because they're so different from everything that we're accustomed to. We have trouble finding the words to describe the kinds of textures and, and movements and, and colors that we see in, in these creatures. The only way you're going to be disappointed is if, uh, if you're looking for a 12-headed a monster with, uh, with big fangs that uh, is going to eat your ship. Robeson is one of the scientists at the cutting edge of oceanography, a science hardly a century old, which has its origins in a voyage made from England. London's Natural History Museum is home to one of the world's oldest and largest collections of marine specimens preserved in formalin since the last century. It's called the Challenger Collection, after the ship that found them. The 1800s were an extraordinary age of discovery and exploration. In 1858, Darwin had set the scientific world alight with his theory of evolution. Ten years later, the public was captivated by Jules Verne's book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But despite all this, the world still believed that nothing could live in the deep oceans. It was HMS Challenger's mission to find out if this was true. She set sail in 1872 on a journey that would change our understanding forever. Well, the Challenger expedition had a number of objectives and the principal one was to investigate 
life in the deep sea. The background was the Azoic theory that nothing lived there, and although there'd been glimmerings of indications that this was, wasn't so in the late 1860s, 